United States, New York, Queens, November 12, 2001. 6.30 a.m., JFK Airport is on high alert. The atrocity of 9-11 is still fresh in the minds of Americans. And for everyone in the airline industry, security is a major concern. On the tarmac, the crew of American Airlines Flight 587 prepare for a three and a half hour flight to the Dominican Republic. Captain Ed States, the senior pilot and his first officer, Sten Molen, carefully check the exterior of their aircraft. The son of a pilot, Molin has 10 years experience with the company, joining American Airlines at the age of just 24. Like his father before him, Sten sees it as much more than a job. If he wasn't a pilot, he, d he doesn't know what he would be doing because it was that important. He loved his job. Traveling to the Dominican Republic this morning are 251 passengers. Among them, 83-year-old Hippolito Algaroba and his 73-year-old wife, Ubensia. The elderly couple have decided to return to their homeland for their twilight years and are expecting their son, Hector, to show up and see them off. They're going home for good because they have raised three kids and uh, their job is done. The couple have arrived well before their scheduled departure time. So early, the airline offers them seats on an earlier flight. By the time Hector gets to the airport, his parents have already checked in. But his mother comes back from departures to say goodbye to her son. I'm fine. How's that? I asked about my father, and she said that he's fine, and uh, he said he'll see me when I get there in a couple of months. And uh, I gave her another kiss. I guess that was the kiss for my father. At 7 a.m., Ed States and Sten Molen begin pre-flight checks. The aeroplane is an Airbus A300-605R, capable of carrying up to 266 people. Built in Europe some 13 years ago, it is one of the oldest in the American Airlines fleet and has racked up over 37,000 hours of flying time. Nevertheless, the Airbus is recognized as one of the most reliable airliners in service. Today, though, that reliability has been undermined by the stringent new security measures. Every passenger is searched twice before boarding is allowed, and the scheduled takeoff time of 8.40 begins to slip. By 9 a.m., all 251 passengers are on board. I'll program the computer. Pre-flight checks are complete. Clear right. Clear left. And flight 587 begins to taxi to runway 31L. It's a fine day, and Sten Molen, the co-pilot, will fly the plane on the first leg. 9.11 a.m. A Japanese airline 747 immediately in front of 587 is cleared for takeoff. The controller gives Molin and States a routine caution. He tells them there's a risk of air turbulence from the Japanese plane ahead. Clear for takeoff, American 587 heavy. Captain States knows that he must keep a safe distance between himself and the Japanese airliner. Every plane creates a wake of turbulent air as it takes off, which can affect following flights. You happy with that distance? We'll be all right once we get rolling. So you're happy? Their flight path will take them across Jamaica Bay and over the Rockaway Peninsula in the borough of Queens. It's a popular residential area, especially with New York's fire and police departments. Today is Veterans Day, a public holiday, but not everyone is having the day off. Okay, I'm on. Police Chief Michael Morley and his wife will be working. His mother-in-law is looking after their two-year-old baby, Michael Jr. Okay, Mikey. It was just another day. I just had spent about the first week of not doing 12-hour days going down to the World Trade Center. Now, a week later, they started trying to get the police department to get back to normal. Mike Morley's next-door neighbor is Lois Shaw, a financial controller for a lighting company. It was a beautiful day, and I just left and got into my car, and I really didn't think about anything. And I'm just driving to work. Because it's a holiday, her husband, Mark, is at home. He's taking their 15-year-old son to the doctor. 
Jason, come on, let's go. If he can get him out of bed. I say, like, what are you doing in bed? And like any other teenager, he gives me that uh, answer. I said, come on, it's time to get up, we gotta go. 9.14, Sten Molan starts the takeoff run. Rotate. 9.14 and 29 seconds. D2. Flight 587 lifts off. Positive rate, gear up, please. Ground control at JFK wishes them well and instructs Molin and States to contact New York departures. 9.15. Flight 587 is now at 1,700 feet. The departure controller gives them a navigation fix. New York, American 587, heavy turn left, proceed direct wavy. We'll turn direct wavy, American 587, heavy. One second later, the plane begins to shake. Pilots know the turbulence is likely to have come from the Japan Airlines jumbo up ahead. It's a routine hazard, and Molin flies through it. 250, thank you. The captain increases the speed of the plane to 250 knots, the maximum allowable at that height. But seconds later, the plane hits more turbulence. Sten Molin takes decisive action. Using his foot controls, he applies the rudder first to the right and then to the left to try and stabilize the plane. Back power! Again, Molin asks for more power to keep the aircraft under control. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Full power, please! Less than two minutes into their journey, Flight 587 is in deep trouble. The lives of 260 people in the air and many more below are in mortal danger. 89 seconds after takeoff, Flight 587 is in trouble. In the cockpit, co pilot Sten Molen is fighting the controls. What the hell are we into? I'm stuck in it! Get out of it! Get out of it! Far below, 53 year old Pete Hayden, deputy chief of the New York Fire Department, is taking his first day off since September 11th. His attention is drawn to a plane making an unusual straining noise. It's struggling. I look up. It's lower in the sky than normal. I'm watching it, and the plane suddenly begins to break apart. Holy! I see the back part of the plane behind the left wing break open. Smoke and flames come out. As the plane spins out of control, the engines shear off. Mark Shaw, still trying to wake his son, also hears the plane. And I think that it sounds just like the Concorde. Come on, Jason. You know you have a doctor's appointment today. Come on, get up. The house starts to shake. Pete Hayden watches in disbelief. At 9.16 and 15 seconds, Flight 587 slams into the ground. At 9.20 a.m., a pilot who has seen the crash alerts air traffic control at JFK. Yeah, look at the south of the aircraft crashing. Say again? An aircraft just crashed to the south of the field. An aircraft crashed south of the field? Aircraft fireball. Controllers see a black pall of smoke over the suburb of Rockaway. On the ground, an amateur cameraman captures the horrifying scene. Houses are crushed and burning. Aircraft parts are everywhere. The whole neighborhood seems to be under attack. One of the first at the scene is Deputy Fire Chief Pete Hayden. There are bodies everywhere, all over the streets, in the yards. 
some victims still strapped into the seats of the airplane. For Pete Hayden, the scene is all too familiar. It's 9-11 all over again. Only this time, it's his own neighborhood that has been hit. I'm wondering who it is that I know today that was killed. As the full scale of what has happened becomes apparent, residents are in a state of shock. The engine fall down and the, the belly fall, the piece then left side and make it set all the way down. From across New York, emergency services race to Rockaway. Among them, Inspector Michael Morley, who is horrified to hear the plane has crashed close to his own home. His first thought is for his son and his mother-in-law. I know my son is at home. I know my mother-in-law is in the house. So I'm panicking like every other father. You know, I'm thinking, oh my God, what if my kid's killed? What if, I don't know what's going on with my family. Michael Morley's next door neighbor, Lois Shaw, is traveling to work when she gets a terrifying call from her husband, Mark. What's gone, the house? He's screaming hysterically, the house is burning down. So I, I just totally freak out and I'm trying to scream, where's Jason, what's happening? But we get disconnected at this moment. Horrified, Lois heads home. News of the disaster spreads across the city. Roger, I'll have to cut you off. Uh, we are just learning from Associated Press that there has been a plane crash in Queens. Hector Algaroba is having breakfast in a diner, having left his parents at the airport. The word that we have is that it is an American Airlines jet. Is an American Airlines jet. Is an American Airlines jet. He's not certain which flight his parents caught, but his blood runs cold. Hundreds of firefighters from across the city are now fighting the blaze. Mayor Giuliani arrives to see the damage for himself. We'll do everything we can to help these people, everything. And the president is on top of it. They're alert. They're watching everything else all over the country. So I think people should remain absolutely calm. But New Yorkers believe they are being attacked again. The city is in meltdown. The Empire State Building is evacuated the United Nations is in partial lockdown. Airports are closed, and all civil aircraft are grounded. Armed F-15 Eagles scramble, and other jets are on strip alert around the country. Tunnels and bridges are closed. The city is gridlocked. Americans fear their worst nightmare is unfolding once more. The plane has crushed four houses on the intersection of Newport Avenue and Beach 131st Street. Across the road, five more houses are ablaze. One of these belongs to police inspector Michael Morley. When he arrives at the scene, he is horrified. There is no sign of either his baby son or his mother-in-law. On his doorstep, two of his own officers are waiting for him. Is anybody left inside? My mother-in-law was babysitting Mikey. Because I said, my son's in the house. And they said, we looked, there's nobody in there. They thought <coughs> that maybe I was in there sleeping also. Uh, so I said, well, did you look good? And they said, yes. As rescue vehicles race to the scene, roads into Rockaway are gridlocked. Lois Shaw battles desperately to get back to her family and home. I had no idea what, what I was going to find or what had happened, but I was thinking that I just have to get to my house. I have to get to my house. Michael Morley is in a desperate situation. His own loved ones are lost in the heart of the raging inferno, yet he's also the officer in charge of the scene. I'm just a regular guy, and all of a sudden you're the highest ranking police officer on the scene of a major catastrophe like this. I knew in a little while the whole police department's gonna start responding and everybody's gonna come and be helping out, but for right now, I'm in charge. What do you do? Desperate to find her son, Lois Shaw abandons her car. She runs towards her burning house until she comes to a police cordon. That's my house. I've got to get in there. I've got to... Four policemen, I remember, holding me back, and I was screaming, let me go. My son is in the house. Let me go. No, no, my son is in there. My son is in there. Please, please let me through. Michael Morley still has no idea what has happened to his own family. When senior police chiefs arrive, they hear his baby son and mother-in-law are missing. And one of the chiefs says, hey, Mike, what are you still doing here? I said, I'm just trying to help out, boss. And he says, get out of here, go find your family. I said, all right. More and more people desperate for information arrive at the scene of the tragedy. Among them, 
Hector Algaroba. He believes his parents were on the plane, but is praying for a miracle. The hope was somehow all the smoke and all the fire that I'm seeing is from some sort of impact of the plane trying to land. And there has been a lot of people that survive. I'm trying to cling to whatever hope because the last thing a human being loses in life is hope. In the middle of the carnage, Lois Shaw is still looking for her family. I'm running to see if Jason is alive, and I feel unreal. And all I see ahead of me is smoke. I can't see anything. Michael Morley races frantically from house to house, desperately hoping his loved ones will be sheltering with a neighbor. Eleanor! Anybody who's a parent, you, you lose your kid in a, a Kmart or a Walmart or something like that, and you just get that panic and your stomach goes into knots and you start sweating, you're getting nervous, and you don't want to think the worst, but you can't think of it, and then just magnify that by, you know, a hundred times because a plane crash just was right on your house. Jason, answer me, Mark! Then, Lois Shaw hears the shout Jason! she's longing for. And I looked, and that's when I saw Jason and Mark. Lois! Lois, we're over here! Once I saw him alive, that was, at that moment, that was all that I really cared about. Nothing else really mattered. Oh my God, are you okay? Oh, Jason! Jason and his father are alive and well. They got out of the house with seconds to spare. Oh my God, thank God! Oh, thank God, you're okay. Give her a big, big hug, she was so crying. That's when she, and then she was like, what, are you okay, are you okay? I was like, like, I didn't really have any emotions. It was just good to be together. A block away, Michael Morley is still frantically searching when a neighbor calls him over. Hey, Mike, get over here! Got him, right in there, right in there! I saw him. <laughs> it, it was a fantastic feeling, because I, two seconds earlier, I'm starting to panic, thinking maybe they really were dead, and you turn around and there they were. My son was crying when he saw me, and I, you know, you get worked up when your son's crying, and like my eyes started getting wet. But I just held him for about five minutes. But for each moment of joy, there are a hundred of despair. Stan Molin, father of the co-pilot, gets a phone call with devastating news. I told him that call came in. You can sort of, you know, hope that it was a different airplane, but. Uh... That, that, that was uh, the, oh no, this can't be, moment. In the Dominican Republic, relatives expecting a family reunion at the Santo Domingo airport are suddenly confronted with an appalling reality. Their loved ones are dead. Hector cannot leave until he knows what has happened to his parents. He waits, hoping desperately. With the fire under control, the body count and identification of victims is underway. Mayor Giuliani holds a press conference. We have uh, so far um, recovered 132 bodies. And as, I, and as the governor said, there were 255 uh, people and crew members uh, that were listed on the manifest and uh, I want to again express my sympathy and condolences to everyone involved. After the announcement, Giuliani meets the bereaved families and personally gives Hector the news he is dreading. He hugged me and gave me his condolences by telling me that my parents were on that flight. It's just two months and one day since 9-11. The parallels with America's worst terrorist outrage are striking. America looks to the White House for answers. At 12 p.m., White House Press Secretary Harry Fleischer makes a statement. First information is always subject to change. We have not ruled anything in, not ruled anything out. Then President Bush interrupts a meeting with Nelson Mandela to make a statement. We sent our FEMA teams over 
the FBI is over there. And this investigation is being led by the National Transportation Safety Board to make sure that the facts are, uh, are fully known to the American people. How did Flight 587 end in catastrophe? Why did one of the most reliable aircraft in service break up in midair and come crashing down on a residential suburb? Now, by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal the facts behind one of the worst aviation disasters in US history and how the truth sent shockwaves through the entire industry. Less than an hour after the crash, 21 NTSB officials, the GO team as they are called, are on their way. The man in charge is Bob Benzel, a veteran investigator who's handled 94 major air disasters including the 1988 Lockerbie bombing over Scotland. But not even Lockerbie can prepare him for pressure like this. It was particularly important for us to get this one right the first time. There was no, no payback in changing our minds or anything like that. Benzon knows that the early hours of an investigation are the most critical. His team start gathering evidence at the crash site, a dangerous, shocking and distressing business. From a personal standpoint, I'll take deserts, I'll take cornfields, I'll take mountaintops, I'll take swamps before I'll ever investigate accidents in cities. Potentially crucial clues also come from the surrounding area and from eyewitnesses who saw the plane break up in flight. And then the whole plane shook and the tail came apart. That's all I saw and then it, boom. Both engines landed 245 meters before the plane. One fell onto a house the other on a service station. The location of the two engines relative to the main crash site could provide an important clue. By plotting exactly where debris has landed, investigators should be able to determine the breakup sequence. The debris is scattered everywhere. Police and army boats are called in to gather parts from Jamaica Bay. Then, Benzon personally witnesses a major discovery as he drives along the coast road. A crane is lifting the tail fin from the water. That really got our attention. The tail fin is an essential component of the aircraft. Without it, an airliner simply cannot fly. The fin was found floating in the water 1.2 kilometers behind the main crash site. For the investigators, this is clear evidence that it must have been one of the first parts to break away. It could be at the very heart of the accident. But what could have caused such a catastrophic failure? For a tail to simply fall off a plane is virtually unprecedented. Of the hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw the crash, there is no doubt this was a bomb. And I saw an explosion in the sky, and I saw the plane look like one of its wings fell off. Just aiming for the ground, and, and I felt an impact, and then I saw smoke. Well, my neighbor was yelling, take cover, and I really thought, this is it, they've started bombing now. Even for a trained investigator, it's difficult not to jump to conclusions. We're not supposed to speculate at early stages of any investigation. It was very hard not to in this particular case. Hang on to it! Hang on to it! Hey, Mike, get over here! Got it. Right in there! Right in there! After the crash of an airliner into the New York borough of Queens, FBI forensic experts are searching for evidence of a bomb. They are also hoping to find two other key pieces of evidence, the plane's black boxes. The cockpit voice recorder should have recorded everything that was said by the pilots. The flight data recorder could tell them exactly how the plane performed throughout the flight. Each of the black boxes might unlock the mystery of the crash, but lead investigator Bob Benson knows finding either of them is likely to take days. Even then, they could be badly damaged. But just hours into the search comes an amazing stroke of luck. Marion Blakey spokeswoman for the NTSB makes an announcement. We have recovered the voice de co cockpit voice recorder. By now there is a frenzy of speculation over the incident. Terrorism 
is foremost in people's minds. But for Benzin and the NTSB, the lack of any corroborating evidence to support the theory is troubling. There is no sign of suspicious activity at the airport, and no group has stepped forward to claim responsibility for the crash. They take a calculated risk and announce that even at this early stage, they believe this was not a deliberate act. It is the case that the National Transportation Safety Board is the lead agency because all information we have currently is that this is an accident. The plan backfires. Suspicious New Yorkers start to wonder if this is a cover-up. The NTSB takes steps to reassure the public. Should there be any indications of criminal activity, we will certainly make certain that the public knows as soon as we are aware of that and the investigation would change at that point appropriately. For Benzin and his team, the pressure is mounting. Finding the cockpit voice recorder is a huge step forward. With one of the black boxes and the tail fin in his possession, hopes are high they will be able to piece together the reasons behind the crash. Although the recorder is damaged, the tape is still intact and is rushed to NTSB headquarters in Washington. Away from the glare of the media, investigators start to analyze the chilling final moments of the flight. Let's go for power, please. Every word, every sound is carefully analyzed. 89 seconds into the flight comes a chilling sound on the tape. There is a loud bang. Immediately afterwards, the crew can be heard struggling with the controls. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Could this bang be the sound of an explosion? Perhaps there was a bomb after all. With the second black box, the flight data recorder still missing in the smoking wreckage, Benzin knows that the truth will be hard to find. Without that, it makes telling the story more speculative and more difficult. For two days, investigators hunt through mountains of debris for the vital recorder. But instead of where they are looking, the next lead comes from three kilometers away. A pair of security cameras on the Triborough Bridge have captured the last moments of the aircraft. These tapes could hold the key to the disaster. In the grainy footage, the Airbus can just be seen as a black dot. On one camera, the dot disappears behind a building. Then the second camera picks it up. It shows what could be a crucial moment, a faint white streak just visible trailing behind the aircraft. Is this the explosion seen by so many eyewitnesses? Is this the cause of the sound after which the pilot lost control? This could be hard evidence to prove that there was a bomb after all. The only way to find out is to compare the time. If the white streak happened at the same time as the bang captured by the voice recorder, the two are likely to be the same event. Investigators visit the site of the toll booth cameras. Using buildings as reference points, they work out exactly where and when the streak occurred. The results back up their theory that this was not a bomb. We can see that the streak began eight seconds after the initiating accident sequence. The calculations show the streak occurred after the bang on the recorder. The flash is probably fuel escaping as the plane breaks up. This can't be the start of the accident, although it could be the reason so many people thought they saw an explosion. Then, back at the crash site, comes a dramatic development. Investigators get the news they have been desperate to hear. Searchers have recovered the flight data recorder. But the relief is short-lived. The black box is damaged. The NTSB sent it back to the manufacturers to see what, if anything, can be retrieved.
Now, the tail fin that was found floating in Jamaica Bay is starting to yield vital clues. The first thing investigators notice is that the fin is built from a high-tech material called reinforced carbon fiber composite. Often used in racing cars and sports equipment, composites consist of layers of carbon fibers bound tightly together with resin. The A300-600 was one of the earliest civil aircraft to feature this high-strength material, and it's used in many areas of the plane. But when investigators look closely, immediately alarm bells begin to ring. There are six main attaching points connecting the tail to the fuselage. All six have given way. There has never been a plane crash caused by a composite failure, but Benzen can rule nothing out. You have to imagine a force large enough to break six attaching points made out of uh, one of the strongest materials in the world, six of these holding the vertical stabilizer on, and, and all of them broke. So the, the forces had to be just tremendous. The detail of the failure is what worries the team. Plans show how each of the six attaching points has two lugs. One made from aluminium, the other from composites, connected by a titanium bolt. The damage shows that the metal lugs and the bolts remained intact. But the composite lugs all gave way. Benzen has to consider the appalling prospect that the composite material itself may be faulty. With 240 similar planes still in service and thousands more using similar technology, it would have huge implications throughout the aviation industry. If there's something that the composite uh, creators or designers missed 25 years ago that's now just starting to rear its ugly head, that's bad news for a lot of airplanes that are already flying. Proving that the carbon fiber is to blame will need hard physical evidence. Benzen urgently dispatches the stabilizer to specialist labs at NASA to see if they can detect any weakness. Using scanning electron microscopes, experts check over 3,000 square centimeters of surface, magnifying the material by up to 5,000 times as they search for any imperfection. It's a painstakingly slow process, and the pressure is building on Benzon and his team all the time. It keeps you awake at night. Uh, you've got a lot riding on these things, and the eyes of the world initially, and, and then later on, the eyes at least of the aviation industry are, are, are on us. The pressure is also growing on Airbus. Is the design of their aircraft at fault? Has there been an error during assembly? They scrutinize every lug, bolt, and fitting on the tail, including the vertical stabilizer, as it is called. After hundreds of hours of work studying Airbus's design and construction methods, NASA and NTSB scientists finally give the plane a clean bill of health. They can find nothing wrong with the aircraft or the materials used to build it. While the news is welcome, it only serves to deepen the mystery. Although we were relieved in that aspect, we knew we had a long row ahead of us because we still had no idea why the vertical stabilizer really came off. Then, just as the investigation seems to have stalled, comes a vital turning point. Information from the damaged flight data recorder has at last been retrieved. I was very, very relieved. But no one is prepared for the startling picture that the flight data recorder will give. The focus of the entire investigation suddenly shifts from the machine to the man flying it, co-pilot Sten Molen. 83 seconds after takeoff, the recorder shows that Molen applied five extreme movements of the rudder, causing the plane to lurch violently from side to side. The plane slips sideways to its direction of travel, first one way and then the other. 
I've looked at a lot of flight data readouts in my time. I've never, ever seen that particular type of activity occur. They realize that traveling at nearly 470 kilometers per hour, the aerodynamic stresses on the 130-ton Airbus would have been extraordinary. They were virtually unprecedented to us. We were amazed. It seems as though on the fifth movement of the rudder, the entire tail fin broke off. The implication is extraordinary. Simply by manipulating the controls, the pilot broke the aircraft. The NTSB is so concerned, they take immediate action. On February 8th, 2002, they issue a special warning to all pilots of this new danger. But the board have yet to prove that the tail came off simply due to aerodynamic forces. Many pilots doubt that such a thing is possible. The only way to be sure is to run detailed computer simulations, a process which could take months to perform. If the theory is right, then the idea that a terrorist plot must be behind the tragedy can finally be laid to rest. Benzon now faces a new and disturbing mystery. Why did the pilot act in this way? Investigators believe they are close to uncovering the cause of the tragic crash of Flight 587. The flight data recorder shows that the co-pilot, Sten Molen, applied five rapid inputs to the aircraft's rudder pedals, which could have overstressed the tail fin, causing it to break off completely. Now the question is, why would he do such a thing? They listen again to the cockpit voice recorder. We're supposed to be five miles by the time we're airborne. One possible theory is wake turbulence. Wake turbulence is all too familiar to accident investigators. It's a region of spinning air left behind as a plane passes. These vortices can sometimes turn a following plane upside down. But the team quickly realized that this cannot be the cause of the crash. The turbulence was not strong enough to seriously affect a plane the size of the Airbus. The bigger the airplane, the less effect wake turbulence has on it. The A300 is a pretty big airplane. Then comes evidence which changes everything. The investigation team interview Molan's friends and colleagues, and they discover a vital piece of information. A pilot and former colleague recalls an earlier trip with Molan. During an encounter with turbulence, he used the rudder aggressively, even though there was no apparent risk to the plane. The evidence is conclusive. Molin had reacted in the same way before. When those uh, pilots came forward and told us about the first officer's propensity to overreact on the rudders, that was a eureka moment for us. But the revelations don't stop there. When questioned at the time, Molin said he had been taught trained to use the rudder in this way by American Airlines. If this is true, it raises serious concerns for Benzon and the team. One would assume that if, if many pilots go through, through the same training program with some flaws in it, then a lot of pilots have wrong ideas about how to fly uh, an airplane. With 712 planes in service with American Airlines, Benzon must quickly establish where the truth lies. The airline confirms one of their programs does indeed teach pilots to use the rudder to recover from unusual situations, as seen in this training video. And if you don't put that rudder in, what's going to happen? When you get to this portion of the roll, she's going to slice out just like that. Next, Benzon looks at the other tools used to train the pilots, particularly the high-tech flight simulators. Here, pilots are taught to react to a range of emergencies, including wake turbulence. In one of those scenarios, Benzen discovers that the pilots learned to use the rudder very aggressively. The flight simulator program had even been altered to encourage the use of the rudder, particularly when the plane was banking to the right or the left. 
Airbus themselves had already written to the airline, saying this practice was a cause for concern. The classroom work uh, told pilots that it was permissible to use the rudder to escape from uh, unusual attitude situations. And perhaps more importantly, in the simulator, uh, they were taught to use the rudder very, very aggressively to recover from unusual attitudes. The finding causes controversy. At a public hearing, American Airlines claim that Airbus had not explained there were limits to the use of the rudder. I didn't know you couldn't do that. You couldn't do what? Sorry. Be aggressive with the controls. The airline also claims that the rudder system on the aircraft was very sensitive and that pilots might not be aware how much rudder they were really applying. The NTSB investigate and discover the rudder control system is highly sensitive. What's more, the controls of the plane become more sensitive as the plane increases speed. On the ground, the rudder pedal has to be depressed by 10 centimeters to get maximum deflection. But when flying at high speed, that distance reduces to just four centimeters. NTSB officials are shocked to find that this system is not explained in training manuals. There was an apparent uh, gap between what the manufacturers knew about the rudder sensitivity of the airplane and what was filtering down to the folks that actually flew them. Then finally come the results from the analysis of Molin's five rudder inputs. They confirm what nobody really wants to believe, that it's indeed possible to tear the tail fin from an aircraft in flight by stamping violently on the foot pedals. Now Benzen and the team can see exactly what happened to Flight 587. Step by step, they have pieced together the key events that led to the tragedy. Five minutes to disaster. Flight 587 awaits clearance for takeoff. Taxi in position and hold. As a Japanese 747 airliner takes off. 30 seconds later, Flight 587 is given a warning of wake turbulence. Two minutes to disaster, Flight 587 takes off. Positive rate, gear up, please. One minute to disaster, 587 encounters turbulence for the first time. Sten Molen flies through it. 30 seconds to disaster, 587 hits a second, larger wave of turbulence. The plane is now banking to the left, reminding Molin of his simulator training. Rudder movement. Not realizing how sensitive the rudder system becomes in flight, Molin stamps on the pedal, causing maximum rudder deflection. The plane swings violently to the right, placing enormous loads on the tail fin. Investigators believe that an astonished Molin thinks that the plane is reacting to the wake turbulence. He doesn't realize that his own use of the rudder causes the violent movement. Molin immediately slams the rudder pedal into the opposite position. The plane now swings violently back to the left, placing another enormous load on the tail. Both Molin and States believe the plane is somehow caught in the turbulence. What the hell are we into? I'm stuck in it! Get out of it! And in a desperate attempt to get control, Molin applies another rudder input, this time to the right. Now, thoroughly disorientated, Molin again applies full rudder. 587 is now on the brink of disaster. Finally, on the fifth rudder input, all six lugs connecting the tail to the fuselage tear apart. The plane is now doomed. Terrified passengers and crew can have no idea what is happening. Huge G-forces rip both engines away. 106 seconds after takeoff, Flight 587 falls from the sky. 265 people are dead.
Important lessons have been learned from the tragedy. Airbus have issued a bulletin reminding pilots how to use the rudder, and American Airlines have modified their training program. Together with the NTSB, the aviation industry has moved to ensure that such a terrible accident will never happen again.